Hare Krishna. Mm. So today, when, during lunch, we were discussing one verse from the seventh canto. So the devotees asked me, well, maybe you can speak on that tonight. So I thought, okay, let's speak about it. It's, um, hmm. The purport's a little long. It's from Srimad Bhagavatam, seventh canto, chapter one, and it's verse number eight. And it's interesting because the verse reflects the title of the chapter. And the title of the chapter is The Supreme Lord is Equal to Everyone. Mm -hmm. He's equal to everyone. I'll just read the Sanskrit and then I'll read the translation and then purport and then we can begin. Jayakali su savasya. Jaya Kali tu Savasya Devasin Narasya Suram Tamaso Yaksha Raksamsi Tat Kalanu Gunu Bajat. It's an interesting verse. This applies, we were talking about the present world situation, and this verse seems to illustrate actually from a very clear and philosophical point of view the present world situation. When the quality of goodness is prominent, the sages and demigods flourish with the help of that quality, with which they are infused and surcharged by the Supreme Lord. Similarly, when the mode of passion is prominent, the demons flourish, and when ignorance is prominent, the yakshas and rakshashas flourish. The Supreme Personality of God is present in everyone's heart, fostering the reactions of sadvagun, Rajagun Tamagun. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada's purport is a little long, but we'll try to make it uh, clear so you can understand it. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is not partial to anyone. That means he's equal to everybody, no matter what position they are. The conditioned soul is under the influence of the various modes of material nature. And behind material nature is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But one's victory and loss under the influence of Sattvagun, Rajagun, and Tamagun are reactions to these modes, not the Supreme Lord's partiality. So what is happening is that according to these three modes of material nature, which make up the entire material energy, there are different qualities and characteristics of each of these modes, rajas, tamas, and sattvas. In the mode of ignorance, you have madness, sleep, indolence, and uh, in excessive forms of intoxication. In the mode of passion, you have a hard struggle to enjoy this material world through sense gratification. In the mode of goodness, you appreciate higher values, religion, poetry, literature, music, culture. And you live according to those qualities. So whatever you desire, you connect with the mode. So we'll, sometimes we wonder why things happen in a certain way. It was because we desire in a certain way. And as soon as we desire in a certain way, we we connect with the particular mode that will be able to fulfill or satisfy that desire according to the nature of the desire. <laughs> so there's three categories, these three modes of material nature. And the reactions that one gets is through these different modes, not by, not, not by the Supreme Lord. That's why he is impartial. He allows the modes to act accordingly, and according to how we choose to desire and act, we get a particular re result from that. So it says here, when the mode of goodness is prominent, in other words, when the majority of the people are in the mode of goodness, then religion, uh, compassion, good qualities, tolerance, peacefulness, uh, detachment from 
material activities, these are prominent. When the mode of passion is prominent, then it's a hard struggle to try to enjoy this material energy through various types of sense gratification. And when the mode of ignorance is prominent, it's complete darkness and everything is, is destroyed. In other words, people act for the destruction of themselves and for the destructions of others. So the Lord, He, he creates the material energy and how the material energy works. And the living entities have the choice on how they want to live. And according to how they desire, they get a particular connection with that mode. And that brings about a particular type of mentality. And then one acts accordingly. Krishna has nothing to do with that. It's just like the watchmaker. He, he makes the watch. He sets it up. He puts all the different features on how the watch works. But then again, the watch will work according to how he... But what happens in relationship to how people use the watch, the watchmaker has nothing to do with that. It's up to the person how, how, how they use it. So how we plug into the material energy, we get a particular result, and we develop a particular mentality according to that mode, whether it's goodness, the qualities of goodness, the qualities of passion, and the qualities of ignorance. And we pr produce a certain reaction that is concomitant or characterized by the nature of that quality. And Krishna is neutral. Krishna is neutral. So we'll, then we'll get into the point where, where the devotees actually fit into this. Because the devotees don't act within these three modes. We act above the three modes. We act in sattva gun, or what we say, suda sattva, which is pure goodness. Okay, then here it says, the Supreme Lord is not partial. Srila Jiva Goswami in the Bhakti Sandarbha has clearly said, sattva dayo na santishte yatra cha prakriti gunaha sa suda sarva suda bhya puma adya prasida tu la dini sandini samvit tvayakam sarva samstito la datapa hari mrishra tvayi no guna varjite mm -hmm. this is a commentary by Jiva Goswami According to this statement in the Bhakti Sandarbha, the Supreme Lord being always transcendental to the material qualities is never affected by the influence of these qualities. These same characteristics are also present in this in the living. In other words, we don't have to be affected either by the activities of the material energy because we have the same quality of the Lord. This same characteristic is present in the same law in this living entity, but because the conditioned soul by material na nature, even the pleasure potency of the Lord is manifested in the conditioned soul as troublesome. In other words, we desire happiness and that we desire pleasure, but because we connect with one of the three modes, we get a type of pleasure that is characteristic of that mode. Does that make sense? Is it clear? In other words, your happiness or the quality of the happiness you produce is characteristic by the mode. So a person in the mode of ignorance will be happy by, you know, getting intoxicated and getting a lot of sleep, speaking nonsense and causing problems with other people. <laughs> a person in the mode of passion will be happy by getting a lot of, getting money, enjoying sex life, um, uh, getting power, position, influence in the material world, or just satisfying their senses in different ways. A person in the mode of goodness will find happiness with religious principles, with music, culture, song, uh, giving in charity, being a good, nice, kind person, and giving in, and helping other people when they're struggling. So people will find different types of happiness according to how they, they desire, and that desire connects them with that particular mode, and that, that quality of happiness becomes the results of their activity. 
So when you understand this, then you can understand what's going on in the world today because the demons are prominent now. The demons are, in, why are the demons prominent? Because people are sinful. People are trying to enjoy this material life in sinful ways. And therefore, the demons have risen to the point where they have, it says here, as it says, when the mode of goodness is prominent, the demigods are in control. When the mode of passion is prominent, the demons are in control. And when the mode of ignorance is prominent, the yakshas and rakshas, the fierce uh, demoniac people, they become prominent. And then everything is in hell. That's, that's complete hell. <laughs> right now we have a combination of modes of passion and ignorance that's going on in the world. So the demons seem to be in control because people are living a sinful life. And a sinful life, you know, there is no morality is what you want it to be. You can define your own sense of morality now. And now people don't even get married. They just live together. They call that some kind of form of relationship. They, have no, they don't take any sacred vows. They just want to enjoy each other's association and if something goes wrong, there's no legal bound binding anymore and people just go on their way to the next situation in life. Uh, you know, so many forms of sinful activity is accepted in society today as normal. <laughs> Therefore, the demons are in control. <laughs> through the propaganda, through the media, through the news, through everything that's going on, it's all based on that same principle Try to enjoy your senses as much as possible. And this is the way you'll find happiness. Mm -hmm. Through intoxication and the, the various types of enjoyment in different ways, sex life. You can name it, it becomes a way of life. And uh, therefore the mode of goodness, as Prabhupada would say, is conspicuous by its absence. When you notice something is not there, you notice it. <laughs> Just like if, a, if you know a certain person is supposed to be show up at a particular event, and you're at the event, and you don't see that person, it becomes noticeable that person's not there. <laughs> so it's noticeable the mode of goodness is not there <laughs> in the world today. Modes of passion and ignorance are very strong and they're becoming stronger and more and more moving down towards ignorance is becoming more and more prominent now. And, uh, so, but Krishna is neutral. And we'll, we'll talk about where Krishna fits in, in a little while. <laughs> He's neutral, but then again, he does play a role. And you'll see that. Okay, so in, in here, now Prabhupada goes on to say, in the material world, the pleasure enjoyed by the conditioned soul is followed by many painful conditions. So material happiness leads to material distress. <laughs> you can't have one without the other. It's like having a coin, and it has the one side is heads, the other side is tails. You have two different sides. That makes up the coin. If you have a coin with two heads, it's not a coin, it's fake. <laughs> so, material happiness leads to material distress. It, it, they go together. You can't separate them. It's just the way the material energy works. You have something you're enjoying, after some time it changes or you lose it, distress comes in. <laughs> okay, now here probably gives an example. For instance, we have seen in that in the two great wars which were conducted by Rajaguna and Tamagud, both parties were actually ruined. The German people declared war against the English to ruin them, but the result that both parties were ruined. Although the Allies were apparently victorious, at least on paper, actually neither of them were victorious. Therefore, we should be it should be concluded that the supreme personal of God, the supreme personality of Godhead is not partial to anyone. Everyone works under the influence of the various modes of material nature, and when the various modes are prominent, the, de the demigods or demons appear victorious, 
under the influence of the modes. Hmm. So, therefore, yeah, so Krishna is neutral, the modes are prominent, and these people ride to, rise to the, to the power position according to the nature of the modes. And then Prabhupada goes on to recite some verses from the Bhagavad Gita. The manifestation of the mode of goodness can experience when all the gates of the body are illumined by knowledge. O chief of the Bhartas, when there is an increase in the mode of passion, the symptoms of great attachment, uncontrolled desire, hankering, and intense endeavor develop. O son of Kuru, when there is an increase in the mode of ignorance, madness, illusion, inertia, and darkness are manifested. The Supreme Personality of God who is present in everyone's heart simply gives the results of the increase of the various qualities, but he is impartial. Sometimes people say, well, why doesn't God do something? <laughs> he, he tells you what you should do, and if you don't do it, then you have to get the results of what you're doing. <laughs> it's not like you can go on with your sinful activities and expect to get free from the reactions. Or people can do the wrong thing and expect God to correct it and then they will get something different. No. You get it. Everything works according to a certain plan. But Krishna tells, this is what you should do and how you should act. And if people follow, they're free from the influence of these modes and they come to the higher platform or Krishna consciousness or transcendental platform. Here we go, he says, the Lord supervises victory and loss. He's a supervisor. He does not take part in them. <laughs> so when, when you know Krishna's position in relationship to how everything works, and you can see what's going on in the world today. It's according to the power of the three modes and how people are living their life. They kill animals, sinful reaction comes. What happens when sinful reaction comes by killing animals? then they're suffering in that country or in that community. So the Lord says, don't do it. And if you do it, you can't expect not to get the reaction. What is the reaction? Is that when you kill, you must be killed. That's what it says. Those who kill are also killed. <laughs> and those who take part and support killing also get a reaction of the same thing that the killer performs. These are the strict laws of material energy. It's very powerful. You can't get out of these material energy. It's so, so tightly controlled that every, every activity has a particular result to it according to the nature of the activity and the consciousness that the activity was presented in. And then Prabhupada winds up the purport. The various modes of material energy do not work all at once. <laughs> The interactions of these modes are exactly like seasonal changes. Sometimes the mode of goodness is prominent, sometimes the mode of ignorance is prominent, sometimes the mode of passion is prominent. Sometimes there is an increase in, in Rajagun, sometimes increase in Tamagun, sometimes increase in Satyagun. Generally, the demigods are so charged with Satvagun and therefore, when the demons and the demigods fight, the demigods are victorious because the prominence of satgugum qualities. However, this is not the partiality of the Supreme Lord. That's the end of the purport. So you can see. Omagyan timirandasya gina jana salakaya chaksun militam yena tasmai shri gurubena maha. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudamani Pachari Ne Nirvase Sasunyavari Pasyatyade Satari Ne Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai And there's another verse that I'll read. Yeah, the marker is right at the verse. It's interesting. <laughs> it's amazing. Here, okay. So this is from the, and this connects with this previous verse, and it's also very much in line with the present day civilization, what's happening in the world today. Uh, by, the, by good behavior and freedom from envy, one should counteract suffering due to the other living entities. 
So if you if you're free from envy and good behavior, and you can be avoid you can avoid being victimized by other living entities. By meditation and trance, one should counteract sufferings due to providence. Providence means higher powers, like what's happening now. By meditation and trance. By practicing hatha yoga, pranayama, and so forth, one should counteract sufferings due to the body and the mind. Similarly, by developing the mode of goodness, especially in regard to eating, one should conquer sleep. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you want to conquer sleep, regulate your eating. <laughs> when you find perfect regulations in your eating patterns, then you can control and, and uh, work, you can sleep in such a way as that you get just what you need, not too much and not too little. It's all based on your eating habits. <laughs> So that eating and sleeping is very much connected. Sleeping is a byproduct of eating, really. Okay, now, Prabhupada's purport, which is very much connected to what we just read. By practice, one should avoid eating in a way that other living entities will be disturbed and suffer. Since I suffer when pinched or killed by others, I should not attempt to pinch or kill any other living entities. People do not know that because of killing innocent animals, they themselves will have to suffer severe reactions from material nature. People do not know that, just like these slaughterhouses are going on and around the world, and people are wondering, why there's so much suffering in the world? Why? Because you're killing living entities for no reason other than to enjoy sense gratification. Uh, okay. Any country where people indulge in unnecessary killing in a of animals will have to suffer from wars and pestilence imposed by material nature. That's what we have now. Comparing one's own suffering to the sufferings of others, therefore one should be kind to all living entities. One cannot avoid suffering inflicted by province and therefore, when suffering comes, one should fully absorb oneself in chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna. One can avoid suffering from the body and mind by practicing mystic hatha yoga. That's the end of that. So what Prabhupada is saying is here, suffering comes by way of inflicting suffering on others for no apparent reason. So, around the world, there's unnecessary killing of animals, mostly slaughterhouses, and you have abortions. Just to enjoy sense gratification in different ways, people will willingly kill other living entities just so they can find some so-called pleasure from the various modes of material energy. And therefore, it says, and this is, this is the thing that even some great philosophers who are not devotees, who don't practice devotees, can see the connection between wars, diseases, and in killing of innocent animals. As Krishna says, I am equal to everyone, I'm partial to no one. So Krishna loves the animal just as much as he loves the, the human being. Why? He doesn't see the body. He sees the soul. Every, every living entity has a soul, and every soul is equal to God. Even the ant has a soul, and that soul is equal to the same soul that's in the living being as a human being. But the humans have more intelligence, and therefore they're, they're expected to act in a different way. But therefore God arranges for each living entity to live according to the body they have in a peaceful way without being disturbed. But when the living entities in the form of humans take advantage of that and exploit lower living entities for the sake of sense gratification, you create what is called this karmic collection of karma. And when the karma builds, and this is all negative karma, when it builds, it breaks. It's just like, if you know what a boil is, a boil is like an infection in the blood inside. And when it comes, it comes like a little red mark on your skin. And then if it's not treated properly, or if you continue to 
act in the same way, that boil becomes bigger and it turns into a big sore. And then it has all kinds of contaminations and it becomes very, very painful. And then you have to go to the doctors to get it cured. And then if it breaks, and then that, that, that all of that uh, contamination goes around, it can also spread and cause more disease. So that's what's happening in the world today. There's so much bad karma that's been collecting for years and years and years. It breaks, and when it breaks, wars and pestilence are happening. And where the devotees stand, Prabhupada says, this is called providence. Higher powers are allowing this to happen because it's under the influence of the modes of material nature. So Prabhupada, Prabhupada says, when these sufferings are inflicted by providence, how do you get out of it? Chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> by taking shelter of Krishna in the form of his holy name, and of course engaging in devotional service, you're not under the influence of passion, ignorance, or goodness. You're transcendental. You have, you're not affected by that. Why? Because the Supreme Lord gives protection to the devotees or to anyone who takes his shelter by glorifying him, particularly in this age, because the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is the most and most powerful recommended source in which to become free from the influence of the material energy and raise your consciousness to the spiritual platform. So in one sense we have nothing to do with what's happening in the world today as long as we take shelter of Krishna. It can't affect us at all, not at all. But if we don't take shelter, then we are victimized by what goes on in the world. Um, and that we get some disturbance. But not like those who are sinful. Those who are sinful get the direct reactions based on their connection with the three modes of material energy. So it's very clear when you, can, when you understand these two verses and you read them together, you can see every, the picture is clear. The demons are in control now. <laughs> and they're inflicting suffering on everyone. And because people are sinful, and therefore, Krishna allows the demons to give people their react, the results of their sinful activities. He uses the material energy as a punishing element for people because of their sinful activities. Now you might say, well, people have been sinful always, right? <laughs> Why all of a sudden now? It's because and when... When piety goes out the window, when, when the mode of goodness becomes so inconspicuous by its absence, in other words, you can't find the mode of goodness anymore, it's all passion and ignorance, then when it's such a collective uh, mass of wrong, sinful activities, then the whole world is affected by that. And the demons take advantage of that by exploiting people more and more because their, their whole idea is to enjoy sense gratification through control, control. The demons are not so much interested in money. They have money. They're powerful, very powerful. But they're interested in control. Krishna's the, Krishna's the creator. Krishna is the maintainer, Krishna is the destroyer, right? He creates through manifesting himself as Lord Brahma. He maintains as he manifests himself through Lord Vishnu. And he destroys when he manifests himself through Lord Shiva. These are the three personalities that work to facilitate the material energy through creation, maintenance, and destruction. And it's Krishna manifesting himself in these three personalities. But when the living entities, hmm, let's see, I had one point I was gonna make. But when the living entities take shelter of Krishna, they're no longer influenced by any of these three modes of material nature. But the rest of the, the, rest of the world is because the demons want to be 
Creator, maintainer, and destroyer. They can't be creator. Krishna is the only creator. But they want to be the maintainer and they want to be the destroyer. We maintain you. If you don't follow us, we destroy you. <laughs> Control. Control is a very, very strong form of sense gratification. It's intoxication. You know. Sex life is one form of material happiness, and sometimes they say that's the greatest form of material happiness. But those who have all that understand that there's a greater form of satisfaction in material life, and that's to control and use others according to your own desires. That's demoniac, of course, completely. The demons get pleasure out of that. You follow us, if you don't follow us, we kill you. <laughs> and if you follow us, we make you happy according to demoniac values and principles like that. And when it becomes chaotic, when it becomes so sinful, then you have man-eating rakshasas and uh, yakshas and these really fierce, horrible demons actually becoming more and more prominent in the world. And they come from other planets, too. Around the Earth, there are planets that are invisible, above the Earth and below the Earth. You don't even know the names of these planets. Some of them are demonic planets, and some of them are, are godly planets. The ones above the Earth are godly, the ones below the Earth are demoniac. As the sinful activities of a particular planet becomes more and prominent than the karma is that people who are, have demoniac natures take birth in that planet. So more and more demons are taking birth on earth now <laughs> because the karma is going down to the lower modes like that. So cause, because the living entities take birth according to the karmic collection of so you see, the world is more or less inhabited by demons now. <laughs> and Prabhupada also said that demons are everywhere. And in 1970, he said, the demons are increasing and they'll keep increasing more and more and you pretty soon that's all you'll have. He said, don't worry, chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> Pre Krishna will protect you. And he said, Prahlad Maharaj was harassed in so many ways, but he took shelter of Krishna. His father was the biggest of all demons. He was so powerful that he had subjug subjugated all the demigods except Brahma, Shiva, and Narada. Those are the three demigods he didn't subjugate. Even Yamaraj was, in, was following, uh, and Yamaraj is very powerful. Harani Kashipu. But little Prahlad, what was he? He was just a five-year-old boy. But he had complete devotion and faith in the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, he was fearless. He knew that Krishna is there and there's nothing I have to worry about. I simply take shelter of Krishna. And so his father tried so many ways to kill him. And Prabhupada was, was, was inter it's interesting. I was trying to figure it out. How is it when you can be boiled in oil, you can be stabbed by spears, and you can be harassed and uh, trying to be killed in different ways, it's, you don't become affected. I was thinking, where is the logic in that? And then I heard Prabhupada speak something just about two weeks ago in a lecture. He says that when one takes shelter of Krishna completely and is absorbed in that, the material energy can't work upon that person anymore. They become completely freed from the effects of the material energy. Prabhupada says it becomes complete. They nullify the effects of that uh, the material energy. So Prahlad wasn't feeling any disturbance when he was being harassed in so many different ways. They were trying to stab him. They were trying to boil him in oil, throwing mantras to, to, to kill him in my by uh, mantra, so many different, throwing him off a mountain under the feet of the elephants. His father threw him in an ocean, put him through a mountain on top of the ocean. Nothing happened to him. <laughs> and not even a hair on his body was moved. <laughs> That's how complete Krishna's protection was for his pure devotee. 
And so that's available always because those who take shelter of Krishna have nothing to worry about. But taking shelter is a serious thing. <laughs> it's not just, you know, you just say, well, okay, I'll take shelter. No, you have to really chant <laughs> and fully take shelter of the Holy Name with complete sincerity. But we don't do that for protection. It's not like we, we practice Krishna consciousness for protection. That's a byproduct. It's not even the reason for the execution of devotional service. It's simply Krishna's way of preserving his devotees so they can stay and perform their devotional service. The real benefit is to awaken one's natural love for Krishna. And that comes by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So these two verses, if you put them together, you'll see the whole picture of the, what's happening in the world today. The demons are prominent, but don't worry. And Prabhupada also went on to say, even Mother Devaki, you know, she was harassed by Kamsa in so many ways, but somehow Krishna saved her and protected her. But Krishna always protects his devotees. That's why we praise, by here nishingo ridaye nishingo. Wherever I go, Lord Nishringadeva is there. He's there, he's inside, he's outside. He's always there to give protection to his devotees, provided we take the protection. Protect, take the protection means to remember the Lord, seriously absorb oneself in remembering the Lord. But again, we're not interested so much in protection as we are in, interested in developing our love for Krishna. And so through the process of chanting, we purify the heart. When the heart becomes purified, then everything becomes clear, and then one understands the relationship with Krishna and how to act in that relationship, and one is then situated above the three modes of material. And all you may be still in this world, you're not affected by this world. <laughs> it appears to be you're affected, but you're not affected. <laughs> Now this is, uh, this, is these, this is Krishna consciousness. So, so we learn, how, because sometimes devotees get bewildered like the materialists get bewildered. The materialists are always bewildered because they are living in a, in a world of illusion. And the illusion is, I am this body. If you think I am this body, one plus one is three, right? <laughs> It's not two. <laughs> In other words, you're not understanding you, who you are. Who you are. You're not this body. You have a body. But you live in the body, and the body is a product of the material energy, and it work, and it has some connection with the material energy. But that's not you. <laughs> you are completely transcendental to that. So what happens to your body doesn't happen to you, but it appears appears to happen to you. It's just an appearance, that's all. Prabhupada said, we were never separated from Krishna. Even while you're in this illusion in the material world, you're not separated from Krishna. It's the illusion that causes to us to think we are separated. But we can never be separated from Krishna. It's not possible. We are intimately connected with Krishna eternally. We can never break that connection. We can only forget it, that's all. And so when we take shelter of Krishna and we engage in devotional service, we can, ex again, experience that connection. Yes, Krishna is always there. He's always with me. And Krishna likes to protect his devotees. Krishna likes to give pleasure to his devotees when he sees his devotees are engaged in devotional service, especially the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, like that. So Prabhupada said, yes, the demons are increasing, but don't worry, Krishna will protect you. He said there'll be some disturbances, that's all. <laughs> but he said you have to tolerate the disturbances and go on with your devotional service. That's all. So that's a little bit of uh, today's news report. <laughs> so I thought we'd use Bhagavatam to give you a clearer understanding. So now you know why things happen in a way, because people say, why doesn't God do something? He is. He's telling you what to do. All you have to do is do it, and then things change. But people don't, people don't change. Sometimes devotees think, 
I keep getting the same thing happening to me all the time. Why? Well, are you doing anything different? No. <laughs> what do you expect? <laughs> when you change your activities, then you change the results of what happens to you. <laughs> That's all. Well, changing your activities means first changing your desire. And then when you change your desire, that gives you the strength to change your activities. But if the desire is not changed, and you change the activities because you're afraid of the reactions, and you still have the same desire, you're going to get the same reactions. <laughs> the desire has to change. That's the foundation. That's all we have. We have nothing else but desire. We can't do anything but desire. We desire, and then we connect, and when we connect, we act, and when we act, we get the result accordingly. Desire is the force. So desire, Krishna, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> Just desire Krishna. And then, of course, there's a variety of ways that we can fulfill that desire, but the easiest and most direct way, especially now, is Lord Chaitanya has recommended Hare Krishna. Goloka Premadana Harinam Sankirtan Ratin Jan Milo Kene Upai. That this chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is not a product of the material world. It's coming from the spiritual world down into the hearts of the pure devotees who take that Maha Mantra and distribute it to the entire world population. Those who take, take it are benefited, and those who somehow miss the opportunity, they become unfortunate. So, this is our very simple but very direct and most powerful connection with Krishna through this chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, I can't see the clock, but I know it's there. <laughs> So, any questions or comments? Yes. Uh, you said we have to desire Krishna, but uh, in between, how can we, if we desire something else, what can we do? Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, you desire to be happy, but then you understand, well, how, where, where can I find happiness? So, if you're thinking you're going to find happiness through the material energy, then that desire is, it's a wrong desire. If you want to find, the desire to be happy is natural. So find that happiness in Krishna and then you'll be happy. And that's, that's the proper desire. I may not desire to be happy, I may not desire Krishna, but I desire to be happy. Okay, then where is that happiness? It's in, found in Krishna, then I become, I practice Krishna consciousness to become happy. And when I become happy, then I start becoming attracted to Krishna, and then I don't even think of my happiness anymore. All I think about is how to make Krishna happy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Um, <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, Maharaj, for a nice lecture. I was just wondering, uh, you were speaking about how now demoniac uh, energy is becoming stronger and stronger. And how do you see it now when the golden age is approaching and uh, becoming more prominent? How do things will develop? Will it be uh, turned around and more, more the goodness will come? Yeah. Yeah, but before the, before the golden age comes, there is a period of darkness. It's going to get darker, materially. It's only going to get worse for I don't know how long. But then, at, as they say, the darkest hour is just before dawn. <laughs> so things will, get, things will start falling apart all over the world. And it'll get darker and darker. And people will be, be running this way and that way looking for shelter. But Lord Chaitanya is actually cleaning house. He's using the demons to uh, pave the way to rid the world of, of all the contamination and then pave the way for the advent of Lord Chaitanya's golden age. 
it's slowly happening, but it's going to start happening more in more and more in a more realized way, a more obvious way. But things will get worse materially, so don't don't worry about it. <laughs> Just take shelter of Krishna and stay together as devotees. That's the most important thing. Just as important as chanting is that the association of each other, we give strength, we give encouragement, we give support to each other. We shouldn't try to struggle alone and think that we'll, we'll be able to make it. Sadhu Sangha is very important. Have as many, <coughs> many programs as you can, bring the devotees together for different reasons, to chant, to dance, to hear classes, take prasadam. <laughs> Just try to increase that as much as, as possible. Keeping the devotees together is important. And these programs are there. That's why the temple is here, to bring us all together. <laughs> so we can hear and chant. But don't expect the world to get any better. <laughs> it's not going to, from a material perspective, it's just not going to, it's not going to happen. Because unless people give up their sinful ways, it's just going to continue to spiral down more and more. Yes? Uh, when you were speaking that the uh, Sato Moon uh, is prominent in the society, uh, it, it is said that among 1,000 people, uh, 900 are Shudras, like uh, 90 are Vaishyas, 9 are Kshatyas, and 1 is Brahman. Who said that? I, I heard something like this. Today? I said no, 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 no. <laughs> it is said like this. So my question is, if uh, the Sattva Gun is prominent, how is this society? Because the Shudras are in Town Gun, Vaishyas are mixed Town Gun and uh, Raja Gun. So how does this, is this society made of Brahmanas and wise well, people? Well, if, if Brahminical culture is being practiced, then even if one is a in the lower varnas, they can also, you know, get the benefit of the Brahminical society. In other words, if they're practicing. Uh, therefore, you can't have varna without having ashram. So ashram is the actually the, the facility by which varna actually becomes transcendental, or actually ultimately comes to the mode of goodness first, and then it comes to the transcendental platform. So we want to raise people up. Kalo uh, Sudra Sambhavan. In this age, everyone is born Sudra, but people need training and education. Through training and education, your particular nature starts to, to become revealed, and then you engage that nature in serving the Lord, and that is Daivivan Ashram. Then you, have trend, then you have people doing activities that are connected with Sudra, Vaishya, and Kshatriya, but still, because it's connected to Krishna, it's transcendental, it's devotional, it's, it doesn't have the effects of the lower modes. <coughs> yeah, and that's Prabhupada's program. For him, he said, I haven't been able to establish this Vanashram society, Daivi Vanashram. And he says, if we can do that, and he said the basis of establishing that is farm communities. He said, establish these farm communities, grow your own food, develop agriculture, take, protect cows, use cows for various types of farm work, bulls, cows, both. Live simply. He said, the symbol, he said this is also a direct quote, he says this whole civilization will collapse, it will collapse. It can. And he said, in 1973, he said, this civilization will be finished in 50 years. So add 50 years to 1973, and what do you have? <laughs> Next year. We have time. <laughs> yeah, I have enough time to get a couple cows. <laughs> So Prabhupada wanted us to develop a lifestyle that is not dependent on the present civilization where you could practice Krishna consciousness in an atmosphere 
that is more natural and free from all the encumbrances of city life. Because city means passion. City life means passion, basically. So he said, develop these farms. And these were you can, these were you can develop the Van Ashram systems like that. So that's happening to a small degree, but it needs much more emphasis in order to bring the whole society into that. But we, we're so attached to our materialistic lifestyle that we think, oh, what will I do if I can't just push a button and my light comes on and you know, I plug in my computer and everything works so nicely, what will I do without that, you know? <laughs> but it uh, doesn't mean you can't have that even in a simplified lifestyle. But the idea is to... Um, not work hard simply for sense gratification. Right? Prabhupada, I was reading just yesterday, Prabhupada said, you work a month and a half in the spring for, uh, what is it, planting, and then you work a month and a half in the fall for harvesting. <laughs> and so you work three months a year and you have the other nine months free. <laughs> But you can't do it alone. It has to be done in a, as in a community. Therefore, he said, these farms are for the, for the grihastas, the families. He says, for the sannyasis and the brahmacharis, they can stay in the cities and preach and travel. But for the grihastas, the farm communities are essential to develop our society. Because the majority of our devotees are in the grihasta ashram. And not only the majority, but the large majority. So, yeah, so Prabhupada said, develop these farms. He said, the cities won't last. And you're seeing it already. It's just like, any of you experiencing ex -ex uh, more and more taxation? Those of you who work? The taxes will keep going up and up and up. Pretty soon you take, you'll get your paycheck and they'll say, oh, okay, we owe you $1,000 for your week's work, but we have this tax, that tax, this tax, or this levy, this or surcheck, or this um, going to work tax, or so many taxes. So out of the $1,000, you get 150. <laughs> right now, in the UK, I can tell you this for sure, 40% of people's income is taxed. Higher than 40%. Yeah. 50%, right? Depends on the height of the Yeah, yeah. In, in the UK, UK, if you make over 100,000 pounds, it's 50%. If you make under, it's 40%. So you're working for the government, that's all. And pretty soon it'll be higher and higher and higher, more tax, more tax. And Bhagavatam says people will be taxed so bad they'll leave the cities just to get away. <laughs> Governments will just tax people like hell. And they're doing it already. This tax. Just like, I'll give you an example on a personal level. Uh, there's certain items I can't get in this area, so I get them from London. So I used to have them shipped from London. You know, some food items, some medicines, and certain things. And now, as soon as the UK came out of the EU, the whole thing changed. Now, you pay a tax on the same goods going out of London into the UA, EU, and when it gets to the EU, they tax you again. So you're paying probably twice as much for the product. Then you wouldn't. Then you then the actual price. Mm -hmm. It's all taxation. So I had to stop that getting that particular way of getting those items because I was paying more on taxes than I was on on the items that I purchased. <laughs> and it's happening already now. Tax, tax, tax. So yeah, because the governments, you know, they're broke. <laughs> They get high salaries and then they take all the money from the people and they use they do make these bad programs and everybody has to pay for them. <laughs> anyway, I don't want this is.
too much of the secular stuff, but this is basically what will happen. As Prabhupada says, the governments will become so oppressive that people will just leave the cities. <laughs> They're so bad. Anyway, but for devotees, chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> we have nothing to worry about, and I say that with emphasis. All we have to do is continue to continue in our Krishna consciousness program, but preach Krishna consciousness to the, to, to the suffering people out there. There's so many people out there. They're looking, they're struggling, they're wondering which way to go. They don't know which way to go. Because, you know, everything is happening so fast and they can't understand what. So we have the formula. Right? Just chant Hare Krishna, you can find peace and happiness within yourself. And give them that much. <clears throat> and look towards thinking about these farm communities, how we can build these farm communities. Your country is really good for that. There's many devotees here who have farms. Same with where I am in Slovenia, the devotees have farms. So uh, you might think how to expand those farms more and more. <laughs> and then we, don't, then we won't have to be so dependent on uh, you know, the cities for everything we need, gas and electricity and what else, food, all everything is coming by way of the supermarkets or by the different you know, uh, services that the government provides. If everything collapses, you have no light, you have no food, you have no, <laughs> no energy, nothing. And so, but if you have these farm communities, you can generate your own lifestyle, free from that. You have your food, you have water, you have animals, and you also have, uh, you also have, uh, you can develop methane. Methane it can also transform into energy, and you can use it for lighting, for heating. And that comes from cow dung. Cow dung, and then they have machines to process the cow dung, and you can actually produce uh, heat. You don't even need to, you know, get the, the heat that comes by cold or what they call it, fossil fuels. You don't need those anymore. Get it from cow dung. Cow dung is nice. It even smells nice. Yeah, so Krishna has provided everything that the living and this is, you have to understand this, Krishna has provided everything we need. We don't have to live on this artificial society that says, we are the providers and you are the provided and we give you everything, you give us that paper money <laughs> and then we give you what you want, right? And if we, if we decide to raise the price, then you give us more paper. <laughs> and you work hard for paper, that's all. Why? We were just talking, uh, what was it? Mm. I had a nice lunch today at Mahima's and Mahatma's house. So, uh, there was, she made one very nice, many, oh, everything was first class today. She made one preparation, it was spinach and potatoes. So I was, when I tasted the spinach, I thought, wow. This is not from this world, it's from another world. This spinach is like unbelievable. Then later on I inquired and she said, yes, I got it from this one lady. She grows her own spinach from her own farm. And it was just really good quality. And Prabhupada said, when you grow your own food, it's a hundred times more nutritious than what you buy from the supermarkets. Because the supermarkets are full of pestilence and, you know, the trucks, they move it, they, they move it from place to place. Sometimes you get the food after a few days. And uh, the nutrients are gone by the depleted soils. And it, there's so many problems with food supplies now. And uh, so, yeah, grow your own food and you'll see the nutritional value will increase. And people's health will increase also. <laughs> People get sick so easy now. Why do we get sick? Mostly because we don't really know how to eat properly. And we get food that's, in, that's really not healthy. Or we don't exercise enough, either one of those two. <laughs> well, you work on a farm, get some exercise. <laughs> yes. Like that we are hearing this about farms, 
30 years, for example, already. But it's very difficult to make for one who is not origin you know, from village or who has such as habits. You yeah. know, people are in their own secure world in the city, in the flats. And how long will it be secure? <laughs> how to make this? Uh, I mean, transition. Very difficult to we understand theoretically, but practically. Well. Yeah, I agree 100% with you, because I've seen it in action. There's people who, because of their conditioning, they, they, they can't really accept that lifestyle. But the question is, how long will this present lifestyle be last, where we can... And then you might have to, you might have to be, you might have to make an alternative. What will be that alternative? And this is the way Krishna lived. <laughs> and this is the way people live, just like it says <clears throat> that uh, today 95% of the products on the market that you can buy are non-essential. In other words, you can live without them. <laughs> and five are essential, 5%. Now, if you, take, if you go back 200 years, and the things changed the other way. 95% of the things that were available to people were essential, and very few things were non-essential. So we have a, non, we have a wasteful, useful a wasteful society. We just waste. We take so much out of the earth and we just waste it. You know, you can go into a store and you can buy 21 different kinds of, well, you know, sort of wristwatches, you know. People used to tell time just by looking at the sun. <laughs> We've become so dependent on this technological industrial society, we think, ah, 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 what will I do if I can't plug in my television? <laughs> I'll go to hell. <laughs> I saw a cartoon. Cartoon is the whole world is destroyed, there's nothing left, and there's a man walking around with his television looking for a place to plug in, you know. <laughs> we become so attached to these mechanical and electronic devices that we think, oh, how, how am I going to live without it? But computers, I mean, when I grew up there was no computers. The only computers that people had when I grew up was the bank. And I never had a computer until the year 2002. Somehow, um, I heard about them. <laughs> but now they make everything is that if you don't have a computer, it's just like, well, what's, what's life about? Or now it's even more so, my, my cell phone. That's even more. I was, in, uh, I was in Boston a few years ago giving a lecture at Northeastern University in Boston. Most of the students were Indian students there. And uh, we were talking about what we're talking about today a little bit. And we talked about cell phones. And then at the end of the class, one boy came up to me, young man, very nice. And he was practically crying. I mean, he was really in distress. And he said, he came and he said, he said to me, you know, if I don't have my cell phone for six minutes, I go crazy. I can't, I, for any more than six minutes without my cell phone, I go crazy. And he was serious, he wasn't just saying that. People have become so addicted to these electronic de devices, you know, that they're actually getting married to them, you know. It's a lovely wedding, you know, me and the electronics. <laughs> And there's no divorce either. <laughs> <laughs> Lifelong. <laughs> you know, you go in, you buy your computer. My dear computer, will you live with? Do you agree to follow all of my instructions? So help you God. <laughs> yes, I do. I now pronounce you, man and computer. <laughs> And then you get your nice package, you take it home, and you think, life has never been so nice. <laughs> but, you know, 
What did people do before there was these, all these devices? They somehow lived. <laughs> and they lived more in community and in fraternity with each other as opposed to now where people are separated because of electronic devices. I mean, I've seen so many of these different news reports. You see six people sitting in a restaurant on the same table and they're all looking at their cell phone. Nobody's looking at each other. Six people on the bus, they're all looking at their cell phone. Six people waiting, you know, waiting in the room, they're all looking. You go, I go to airports, I travel, everybody's sitting in there with their cell phone. I'm looking around to see if there's anybody not looking at their cell phone. Then you see one or two old persons, you know, because they grew up without the cell phone, so they still have a little bit of civility left, you know. You can't, in these electronic devices have become addictions. It's not like, and I was driving in, in Calcutta, and this was a few years ago, and I saw signs that uh, if, you're ha if you're having some, uh, what's the word, how do they describe it? That we cure uh, mental illness caused by electronic devices. <laughs> They were advertising this as a cure because people are getting sick, I mean really sick, from using these devices. They're getting brain damages. It's, they say the cell phones actually, especially if you use them in your right ear, you know, it causes a tremendous amount of depletion of the, the brain cells. And people get... Huh? I've heard on the radio it's it's worse than if you if you drive and look at the phone it's it's you are more dangerous uh, than if you have 1.8 promil of alcohol in your blood. Yeah. It's more dangerous. There's so many reports of people crashing because looking at their cell phones yeah. while driving. Yeah. So it's just become you know so prominent that oh yes if I have to live a, lim a simplified life without all of these things, how is it possible? Well, the thing is, what replaces that is people. We've replaced people with, cell with all these electronic devices. Bring people back into your life and you'll find that the life becomes more fulfilling. Yeah. It's kind of div divided people. People are suffering from alienation because although everybody's together, everybody's not together. They're on a different, they're on a different electronic wavelength. Frequency. Yeah, it's it's really bad. I used to, you know, I used to when I got my first got my cell phone. I used to think, oh, okay, I got to go along with the truck. With the, I need it. I guess I got to make phone calls. I used to have a phone, it did, it did two things, that's all. I had it for like 25 years, it was a little phone like this, you flip it up and it does two things, it calls people and it keeps people's numbers, that's all. <laughs> that's all it did. And then people would look at me, oh, he's really old fashioned, you know. <laughs> but. It, but I didn't have any problems. Then they told me I had to get a, something more, you know, up to date. <laughs> so I got one. And then, then I heard it, then I had then his idea, oh, you can write a message without talking to people. Hey, that's great, I don't have to talk to you. It's fantastic. I can communicate with you without even talking to you. This is great. I didn't want to talk to you anyway. <laughs> You know, I, I'll get on the phone and I'll call somebody and they don't answer. And as soon as I write a message, uh, can I call you? And then I get a call. <laughs> yeah. People look for their message. They don't even answer their phones anymore, right? I mean, this is the way it is. Write a message, ooh, that, I mean, that's, that's, that's golden, you know. That's the topmost thing, messages. And then, you, then you're sitting in your room and you're chanting Hare Krishna and you hear your phone going, bong, ooh, another message. Mm, I wonder who that is. 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. <laughs> Krishna, oh, I better not. Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. But it might be important. Okay. Oh, an advertisement. Oh, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. <laughs> You know, bong, oh, another one. That's got to be something important. That's a louder bong. <laughs> so, you know, so I decided, okay, Japa period means shut off the cell phone. <laughs> then I tell people, shut off the cell phone, but then I don't do it either. <laughs> so I thought, I'm becoming like everybody else. I better get back to normal here. So yeah, so it's, you know, it can be addicting. You find yourself getting pulled into it more and more and more like that. <clears throat> and then when you try to break it, as you said, it's like, it's worse than death. <laughs> but then again, the question is, how long will this civilization go on? Because just by the fact that people are living a sinful life and the values are materialist, it can't go on. Time and truth go hand in hand. This is a statement from the Bible. Time and truth, in time truth will prevail. In time God consciousness will win out. In time. But right now we're in a dark time. That's all. Time and truth go hand in hand, ultimately, because sinful life has no substance to it. it there's, no, there's nothing to it. It's, a, it's like a shadow of the real thing. The real thing is devotion. The real thing is compassion. The real thing is love and kindness. These are the qualities that make up human life, not exploitation and uh, just trying to enjoy the senses as much as possible. Devotees don't see it because devotees are somewhat connected, but the outside world is just full of that. <clears throat> yes, you have a question? No, no, it was just a remark. I, I was reading a German, uh, Austrian philosopher, I forgot his name, but he wrote a very, very funny uh, book, The Einzige and his, I, and the only one in his property. And, and there was just when the telephones were invented, yeah. And he said, like, it's an Im inappropriate that when you want to telephone me, you have to first write me a letter and announce when you are going to telephone me. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, correct. That's yeah. the beginning. Yeah, that's the message program. <laughs> and now you see what's happening. <laughs> okay. All right, I don't want to take up too much. You had a question, Prabhu? No. No, okay. All right, thank you. So we'll come together tomorrow night and for another program. Thank you very much, and please chant Hare Krishna. Yoda Prabhupada Ki Jai.